Start the record. We'll start the countdown. Main engine start. And let's uh, get rid of the play sound. And here we go. Welcome to another exciting uh, morning of uh, Astronomy 123. Uh, before we get started, uh, if you, I teach another course. I teach senior design with uh, senior physics students. And uh, one of the students says she couldn't make uh, class uh, today because she had to drive back to Charlotte to vote because her absentee ballot didn't get uh, here in time. So she committed to spending all day driving to Charlotte, voting, and then driving back. So um, if you haven't voted, leave the lecture now and go vote. Uh, this is North Carolina is one of the battleground states. If we lived in New York or Montana, it wouldn't matter what your vote is, but in this state it does. So, uh, you know, years from now, if things work out differently, you can either say, well, I did my part, or you can say, ooh, I forgot. So anyway, if you didn't vote, uh, vote right now. Get in line, do what it takes. Uh, so today we've got a whole bunch of topics. Uh, the next four lectures, remember this course is stars and galaxies. It's really stars, galaxies, and the universe. We're now in the universe part of that. We've been talking about uh, a Hubble expansion and the Big Bang peripherally for the last two or three lectures. We'll get into a little bit more detail now, and then we'll get into a lot more detail in the next two lectures. The last lecture is going to be on life in the universe. Uh, so anyway, let's get started. Share screen. Okay. So uh, today we'll be covering the uh, age of the universe. I know that was on the homework. Uh, something called Olber's Paradox, which is very important. We'll talk about uh, the Copernican principle and the cosmological principle, uh, large scale structure of the universe, uh, and then a preview of dark energy. Uh, although it looks like a lot of topics, these are all fairly short topics. So uh, um, there's not a lot of material today. I'm gonna cover it kind of slowly. I'm open for questions anytime. This stuff is is difficult. It's not that there's no math really today, but this, this stuff is not, it kind of warps your brain because the concept that, that um, you know, space is equal to time is, is, I mean, I can say that, but it, it kind of, well, you'll see, it's, it's difficult to conceive of. So the age of the universe is what we call Hubble time. You had a homework set on that. So the universe is expanding. And if the universe is expanding, that means in the past, it was smaller which means that in the deep dark past, it must have been tiny. It must have been a point. Uh, and so if their galaxies are moving away from us, proportional distance, then they must have been a beginning. And this was one of the most profound philosophical discoveries of the 20th century is the fact that the universe had a beginning. Uh, you know, before, I don't think people thought too much about it other than they thought the universe was eternal, you know. Um, the universe had a beginning and will have an end, which is another philosophical statement. And, and how it will end is something of active research and something that we've been thinking a lot about. Uh, and so if the universe is at a certain density now, as we roll the clock back in time, it will be less and less dense. I mean, more and more dense the farther back in time we go which meant at its creation, it must have been unimaginably dense and unimaginably small. And how long ago that beginning of the universe was is what we call the Hubble time. And basically it's just, we know how fast the universe is expanding. Um, we just, you know, reverse the clock and how long would it take to collapse? Now there's a lot of details in that, uh, but in general, that's it. We know how fast is expanding, so we just roll the clock back and that will tell us how old the universe is. Uh, there's a bunch of misconceptions about the beginning of the universe. We call the beginning of the universe the Big Bang, but it wasn't big and it wasn't bang. So it's, it's what they call a new uh, misnomer. 
if the inverse was packed in such a small point, wouldn't that have become a black hole? Um, yes, actually, uh, the uh, as we talked about on the lecture of the black hole, the Schwarzschild radius for the universe is the size of the universe. So in some sense, you can say that we are living inside a, a black hole, uh, which is kind of weird because there can be black holes inside of black holes. Uh, so if all the matter in the densely packed in such a small amount of space, how, how, how could it not be a black hole? Well, it is a black hole. The entire universe is a black hole. And the, the reason why is that as you get smaller and smaller black holes, the density of matter you need, as we talked about a couple of lectures ago, becomes denser and denser. So the, the density of matter for us to be a black hole is like 10 to the 89th grams per cubic centimeter. I mean, it's, it's, it's like 60 orders of magnitude more dense than a proton. Uh, it's literally inconceivable. But as you add more and more matter, black holes become less and less dense to have the Schwarzschild radius. And when you get to the mass uh, that equals the mass of the observable universe, the radius of the Schwarzschild radius is the observable universe. So it's just, that's just kind of a weird thing. So the Big Bang, uh, so people think the Big Bang was a Big Bang. Well, it wasn't big, it wasn't a bang. Um, the the Big Bang wasn't an explosion in space. The Big Bang was the creation of space itself. And that meant that it didn't occur in space. It created space. There was nothing for it to expand into. Uh, so it, the Big Bang didn't occur in a place. It, it occurred in all places because it created all places. And so we can't say where in the universe, which direction do I look to see the Big Bang? That, that just doesn't make sense. Uh, and the, your body is, as we talked about before, is made up of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, but it's also made up in terms of um, uh, counting the elements. Most of the atoms in your body are hydrogen. The hydrogen in your body is primordial, meaning that it, that hydrogen was created in the Big Bang and has existed unchanged for 13.8 billion years. So every, every piece of mass in your body was created in the Big Bang. And in particular, the hydrogen and helium that is in your body has admitted unchanged uh, since the beginning of the Big Bang. The other elements, carbon, nitrogen, those were created from hydrogen and helium in uh, the guts of stars. Uh, the other misconception, and this is a little tougher, and there are textbooks out there that get this wrong. People think that the redshift is the, oh, good God. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so let's start that again. Okay. Uh, yeah, just be safe. It doesn't look like you're slight. Yeah, thanks so, so much for that. Um, if the universe is a black hole, then why is it expanding outward? Wouldn't it make more sense if it was contracting, being drawn towards the center? So Alex, yes, uh, that is true. It would make sense if it was contracting. Um, but the universe isn't. The universe is expanding. It's expanding because at the point of creation, uh, it also expanded. And, and, and I know that sounds redundant, but we don't know why. It just did. And if it didn't, we wouldn't be here. So uh, that the theory of how the universe expanded is called inflation theory, not to be confused with economics inflation theory. We actually don't cover that much in this course because it's, it's complicated. Um, and it's not so much a theory as a description. So we know that the universe was created with infinite density. One thing to think of it is forget black hole because the size of the black hole with the mass in the universe is the size of the universe. When you have something that's incredibly dense and incredibly hot, it will expand just through basic thermodynamics. Uh, the problem is our laws of thermodynamics don't really work at those densities and pressures. So, you know, we're just guessing. Uh, so, 
Alex says a uh, hundred million early absentee votees. So yeah, that's good. I voted a few months ago. So the age of the universe, the expansion of the universe. Uh, I'm just going to repeat these slides again because I uh, they weren't uh, advancing. Okay. So uh, we have the misconception that the red shifts that we see of the uh, maybe the edge of the universe is the singularity. Yeah. So Sam. It, We'll get into this later. This is why I'm, I'm going to go slow today because we're dealing with concepts that are kind of literally mind blowing. Um, and the concept of the edge of the universe is one of those mind blowing concepts. Uh, so because the edge of the universe isn't an edge of universe in space, it's an edge of the universe in time. Okay. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So one of the misconceptions we have and uh, textbooks, there are astronomy textbooks out there that, that get this wrong, is the redshift that we see from uh, galaxies flying away from us, they actually are not flying away from us. It looks like they are because the redshift, what's happening is the space between us is expanding. The galaxies themselves are relatively stationary. And so the, the, the reason why the textbook get this confused is because we use exactly the same equations. Uh, and it looks exactly like that. But if you see a star in our galaxy moving towards us or away from us, it's in the red shift and blue shifted, that red shift and blue shifted is caused by a velocity, no question. If I see a galaxy far, far away that's receding of us very quickly, that receding is not caused by the velocity of that galaxy it's caused because the space between the galaxies is expanding. Um, and so we call that the, the velocity redshift for the normal day-to-day -day redshift that we've talked about in this course. And then there's the Hubble redshift, which is, which is something, it's the expansion of space-time itself. So galaxies are being separated from each other as space-time expands. Uh, and the math is difficult, but the, the weird thing is, although the math is difficult, the equation that you wind up with is exactly the same. The As the universe expands, the photons themselves also expand. And as they expand, they get redshifted. And so uh, the, uh, the the velocity redshift is because the, the object is moving away from us. The uh, Hubble redshift is caused because the photons are actually expanded as they travel through space-time to reach us. So what is the age of the universe? This is approximately, remember distance equals speed times time. So if Raleigh is 60 miles away and I travel at 30 miles an hour in my Prius that can't go above 30 miles an hour, it will take me two hours to get there. Distance 60 equals 30 times two, okay? Uh, time equals distance over speed. So it takes two hours to go 60 miles if I'm going 30 miles an hour. Okay, so this is just day-to-day -day calculations that we do every day when we drive around. The Hubble constant is speed over distance. So time equals distance over speed. The Hubble constant is speed over distance. So what would happen if we inverted the Hubble constant, we would get distance over speed. In other words, we would get time, the units of time. Uh, and so that's exactly what we do. So we have a galaxy that's one megaparsec away uh, at 70 kilometers a second. How long would it take for uh, that galaxy to be on top of us? Okay. Uh, and it turns out time equals distance over speed. We just invert the Hubble uh, relationship, which is 70 kilo kilometers per second per megaparsec. The time is one megaparsec over 70 kilometers per second. So all I have to do is convert this megaparsec into kilometers and we get about 14 billion years, which is actually almost the age of the universe. Now it's a little different than that because the velocity of the expansion isn't constant. And we'll be talking about that in the next three lectures. Um, it's 13.8 billion years, but this is really close. So the universe is approximately 14 billion years old. This also means that this Hubble constant is one of the most important numbers in, in all of the cosmos, all of, all of our, in, our endeavor to understand the universe. This is a really, really, really important number. 
Um, and in fact, there's major battles going on today about the what exactly this number is. When I was a graduate student, the debate was whether this number was 50 or 200. Now the debate is whether it's 69 or 72. Uh, and the, that, the fact that those two numbers don't agree is really, really important. We don't know what the answer is with that. And in future courses that I'll teach years from now, maybe we'll have an answer. Maybe they'll discover why the age of the universe that we estimate through one mechanism doesn't match the age of the universe we mask, uh, uh, measure through a different mechanism. But anyway, the universe is about 14 billion years old, more precisely 13.8 billion years old. I'm going to go over these things we went over last time, uh, and it's really important, and I'm going to go over this slowly. So let's just bring up uh, the, uh, the polling again. Here is which Hubble plot shows the oldest universe, okay? So A is the distance versus velocity where it's a very high slope. B is where it's a medium slope and C is where it's a low slope. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> D and E, very cute. Okay, so most of you chose C and a few of you chose A. Um, let's go back for a second. So here is the slope, which is the Hubble constant. So uh, the Hubble constant is 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So the, the slope, so as the slope increases, the Hubble number increases. In other words, you get a faster speed per megaparsec. But remember, the Hubble time is one over this number. So as the Hubble number gets bigger, uh, I'm sorry, the Hubble constant gets bigger, the Hubble time gets smaller, okay? So here, this high slope means that the universe would have to be younger because the Hubble constant is larger, the Hubble time is smaller. And that kind of makes sense because this shows that the universe is expanding very quickly, uh, which means that if you run the clock backward, it doesn't take that much time for you get to that the, the singularity, the Big Bang, okay? Conversely, if we look at this one, the universe, the velocities are very low, which means to collapse the universe will take it much longer. And the, the Hubble number is much smaller here. One over the Hubble number, which is the Hubble time, is much larger, okay? So C shows the oldest universe, okay? So what is going on here? Uh, we've got... Um, a, the universe is expanding rapidly and then slowly. B, the universe is expanding then contracting. C, the universe is expanding slowly and then rapidly. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Remember these poles are not graded. Um, yeah, so let's talk about this. The, um, I really wish we were in class and we could talk. Uh, so I'm gonna put my cursor up here and put in the chat, is this, old time or new time? In other words, is, is where my cursor is moving a very long time ago or a short time ago? Yeah, it's very old, okay? And so at the old times, the velocity isn't changing very much, okay? And remember, this is cumulative. So at the old times, things are not expanding very far, 
Okay. But in the new times, which is recent, look, the velocity is very high. So let's try this again. Okay, uh, there still seems to be some debate. I'm, I'm gonna try to do the whiteboard. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it's worth trying. So let's do whiteboard, share, and let's see how this works. Okay, so here is the, here's the graph that we had. Oh, sorry, let's uh, undo. And this is distance, and this is time, okay? So here, right there, at the, this is a very, very long time ago. In fact, this is the beginning of the Big Bang. And the, this velocity here, it's the velocity that's moving away from me that's here, okay? So if there's not much change here, it's not that the velocity is high there, uh, it's that the, the change in velocity is low, which means, how do I say this? The, the velocity the, isn't changing that much. If I take this same, let's undo that, uh, just draw a line, Okay, so here's the same curve, except I'm gonna go uh, that this is gonna be age and actually this is not time, that was velocity. Okay, so I... Yeah, so it looks like, okay. So what we see with the graph on the left is just a duplicate of the previous graph we saw, okay? Which is as we're going away from us, it's showing how fast galaxies are receding from us, okay? Uh, by the way, go ahead and just turn your mic on if you wanna ask. Um, <laughs> and, so close, and so we are at the circle right here, okay? Uh, it, and close to us, universe, uh, galaxies are expanding from us very quickly. And as I move just a small distance away from us, the galaxies are moving very, very fast away from us. As I look very far away, the galaxies are expanding very far away, uh, very rapidly from us, but they don't really depend on distance. In other words, the galaxies that are uh, here, are expanding away from us at almost the same velocity as they are here, okay? And what that means is in the early days of the universe, there wasn't much, there, the universe wasn't expanding very quickly. I don't understand how things slow down and expanding. Is it running out of energy? Yeah, so let me give you, uh, so Douglas, let me give you an, a, a demonstration of energy slowing down. You see this clip? I throw it up. I throw it up and what happens to it? As I throw it up, it slows down. Why does it slow down, Douglas? Or anybody, why does it slow down as I throw this up? Why does this clip slow down as I throw it up? That's correct, because gravity is pulling it back down. So that's the same with the universe. The universe has a bunch of things that are all uh, gravitationally bound. And so as the universe expands, and remember it's expanding from the original Big Bang. It's expanding because it was born 
at a singularity of infinite density and temperature. And that infinite density and temperature expanded very quickly. And from that initial expansion, the expansion would do nothing but slow down because everything is mutually attracting everything else. And eventually, depending on how much matter there is in the universe, that expansion should stop and then uh, go back uh, and recollide. Okay. So, what this graph is showing is the reverse of that. It's showing that the universe is expanding slowly and then expanding very quickly. So, if we flip this graph and draw instead not the velocity versus distance from us, but plot the, um, uh, let's plot the, velocity as a function of age. So we would say that the, uh, here's, the, uh, that's the age and this is the velocity. So this is kind of inverting this graph. What this would show is that the universe, I'm sorry. The universe would start with a slow velocity and then increase with a fast velocity, okay? So this graph implies this graph. Uh, and in fact, it's just the inverse of this graph. So because the velocity isn't changing very much as we look very far back in distance, that's actually looking very far back in time. And so here, if we look from this origin is no longer us. The origin is the beginning of the universe. At the beginning of the universe, the universe was expanding very slowly, and then the expansion accelerates. At what point does the universe stop expanding, and what will happen then? Uh, Mary, that's a great question. We'll be answering that question in uh, lecture number 23, when we talk about the end of the universe. Uh, in particular, this course is, is taught alternate semesters by uh, Katie Mack, a new faculty member here. Katie Mack has just written a wonderful book called The End of Everything. Uh, we just reviewed in the New York Times, and uh, it's now a New York Times bestseller, and I would recommend you picking it up because it will it's a great read, and it explains exactly what the current theories are of how the universe will end, whether it will end in fire and ice. Okay, so here, um, what I'm trying to show you, and, and this, it's hard to understand, that's why I'm spending so much time on it. But this, this graph here, let me go back to the original graph. Shows us a universe that expands slowly and then expands quickly. Okay, so option number C, it expands. And that's because this is distance from us or instead of distance, we could say that it is, can I annotate? Yeah, I guess I can. So, so age, um, so we could go, go. Oh, interesting, I've never done that before. So distance, distance goes this way, age of the universe goes that way. So here, the age of the universe is zero. Here, the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years, okay? And, and so this is just, we're just inverting the graph. The universe expands slowly and then quickly. That doesn't make any sense because our universe is gravitational. Gravity is a, is, a, is a purely attractive force. Everything should attract everything. So the expansion of the universe should have started out very quickly and then slowed down to something that's slow. Okay. Uh, so how do I... Okay, stop that. Huh, okay. Can't get rid of the annotations. So here's the second graph and let's relaunch the poll here. So the question is what's going on here. This graph 
Does it show the universe expanding rapidly and then slowly, the universe expanding and then contracting, or the universe expanding slowly and then rapidly? The name of the book is The End of Everything, Astronomically Speaking. Just go to Google, type that in, or just search for Katie Mack. So Hector, is this exponential? Um, you kind of. So Douglas, I hope I explained why the universe is slowing down. Uh, if not, just put it in text again. Okay, and so that's correct. Uh, again, this universe shows us, um, this is at the beginnings of the universe, and you can see the universe is expanding very quickly. Its velocity is changing very rapidly. And then here, close to us, the universe is expanding very slowly. So this is option A, the universe is expanding rapidly and then slowly. Clear, clear all drawings. Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry, I should have stopped that. Given the fact that gravity is always attractive, which graph should we expect to see? Okay. So there's some debate here. I want you to think about this a second. Um, so again, this is, this is the beginnings of the universe there and there. Okay. And at the beginning of the universe, on the left graph, the universe is expanding slowly. On the right graph, the universe is expanding very quickly. Towards us, towards our day and our time and our place, here the universe is, the galaxies that are close to us are not expanding very rapidly at all, okay? So here, the expansion of the universe is slowed down. It expands very quickly and then expands very slowly. As you see with this clip, this clip, I throw the clip up, it starts off, I give it an initial push. push. After that initial push, what happens is it's, it keeps on going up, but the speed that it's going up is slowing down. It's, a, it's velocity of, of um, expansion it's slowing down and slowing down and slowing down. It's slowing down because everything attracts everything else. Whereas in the left-hand graph here, things are expanding from each other fairly slowly, but in today's time and place, things are expanding very quickly. So it would be almost like I threw this clip up and instead of slowing down, it was accelerating away from me, okay? So let's try, th let's try this again. Okay, so the answer is is B, okay? The answer is B because we will expect, because gravity is always attractive, that as you throw something up, its velocity will decrease over time. You throw a ball up in the air, the, the 
the vertical velocity of that ball will decrease over time because gravity is attractive. That's what we expect the universe to be. Okay. Uh, and, and that is the way our universe is, is made. So hold that thought. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on this because this is really important. What, what I'm telling you is that not only is the Hubble constant important because it tells us how old the universe is, but how that Hubble constant changes with time as we look back to earlier times tells us, frankly, how much matter is in the universe. Because if, if I throw this up and it doesn't slow down much at all, that means there's not much matter in the universe. If I throw this up and it slows down very quickly, that means the universe is very massive and the universe is trying to stop that acceleration. That's called the critical mass. We'll be covering that in the next lecture and the lecture after that. Um, it's an important concept. The universe wants to slow down because of all that mass and how much it slows down. So it's not only the Hubble constant that's important, it's the change in the Hubble constant that's important. Those are the some of the two most important numbers in all of, well, all of everything. Okay. We'll be coming back to this over and over in the next few lectures, but now we're going to take a, a, a slight detour into Olber's paradox. Uh, the question is, why is the sky dark? And you say, well, the sky is dark because it's dark. The only thing up there in the sky is the stars. However, um, if the universe is homogeneous, isotropic, infinite, and unchanging, that would not be true. So let's go over this in detail. If the universe is homogeneous, in other words, every place in the universe has the same density of stars, isotropic, every place we look, they're the same number of stars. And this is what the ancients thought the universe was. The universe is infinite. It goes on forever, and the universe never changes. And as recently as the 1950s, even astronomers thought that the universe was infinite and unchanging, okay? Um, and they didn't really understand how to solve Olber's paradox. And the reason, the dark sky gives me bright eyes. Um, and, and the reason why is that every, if the universe was infinite and unchanging and homogeneous and isotropic, every direction you looked would eventually intersect a star someplace because the universe is, is infinite. So clearly the universe, um, maybe this guy is stark because dust and gas block the light from stars that we don't see. Alex, that's a really good question. Why, Alex says, maybe our night sky is dark because the dust and gas block the light coming from the stars that we don't see. Yeah, and that's the way some people, uh, even astronomers thought that they could solve all this paradox. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because the light from those distant stars will hit that gas and dust and warm them up. In fact, it will warm them up to exactly the same temperature as that starlight. So if the stars are shining like our sun at 5,800 degrees, it will warm up that gas and dust to 5,800 degrees and they will glow just like the star did. So it, it sounds like it could solve the problem, but it doesn't. So, um, Every, so the universe cannot be those four things. Some of those things must be wrong, okay? The resolution, I'll give you the punchline now, and then we'll go over the punchline. The resolution is the universe is not infinite, and it most definitely is not unchanging. We know it's un not unchanging because we know the universe had a creation, okay? The universe didn't exist 14 billion years ago. Uh, it was created 13.8 billion years ago. So the universe is, uh, it's not unchanging. It has obviously changed considerably over 14 billion years. And the fact that the universe is not infinite, is it's, it's not infinite for two reasons. It's not infinite because if we look back in space, eventually we're looking back in time to 13.8 billion years. And we can't look any farther than that. And so there is a limit to what we can observe. We call that the observable universe. And so the observable universe cannot be infinite. It's just by definition. Now, whether the universe itself, the unobservable universe is infinite, we just really don't know because we will never be able to <clears throat> observe it. It's unobservable. 
Uh, but the but just by definition, the fact the universe had a creation meant that the the universe cannot be infinite, and it obviously is not unchanging. So those two are not true. So light from extremely distant objects haven't had time to reach us. So this is yet another case that uh, the universe is expanding so fast that there's a circle, uh, even if it wasn't just the age of the universe, beyond which the, the light from that galaxy is receding from us faster than the speed of light, or the, the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light, and we will never see those universes. So that creates this circle that we cannot ever observe past, okay? Uh, so we've got the, the expansion is greater than the speed of light and the fact that as we look back in distance, we're also looking back in time. Uh, so anyway, here's a video. Why is the sky dark at night? You might think the answer is obvious. The sun isn't up. But the only reason the sky looks blue during the day is that sunlight scatters off of the atmosphere. If we didn't have an atmosphere, like on the moon, the sky would always be dark, even when the sun is shining. So let's rephrase the question. Why is space dark? I mean, space is full of stars, countless stars which are all about as bright as the sun. And in an infinite eternal universe, no matter what direction you picked, if you looked far enough in that direction, you would see a star or galaxy. So the whole sky should be as bright as the sun, night and day. And since it's not, does the darkness of the night sky mean that there's some distance away from us when stars and galaxies just stop? A boundary between something and nothing? An edge to the universe? Not exactly. All of our evidence seems to indicate that space has no edge, but the universe itself does. Not a spatial edge, but a temporal one. As far as we know, the universe had a beginning, or at least a time about 13.7 billion years ago when the universe was so small and crumpled up with itself that our standard notion of space and time breaks down. And since only a finite amount of time has passed since this so-called beginning, that means that some of the stars necessary to fill up the brightness in every direction are so far away that light from them plain hasn't had time to reach us yet. It's as if the universe were a big thunderstorm, and we're still waiting to hear the thunder from the really distant stars. But wait, it's better than that. Since light takes time to travel across the universe, when we point our telescopes at something really far away, we're actually seeing that part of the universe as it was when the light was emitted. So when we look at 13.5 billion year old light, it's not that we don't see stars just because the light from them hasn't gotten to us yet. We don't see any stars because we're getting a peek at the universe before any stars had formed. A starless universe. Now that sounds to me like a pretty good reason why we look up and see a dark night sky. But it's not. I mean, it is true that we can find points in the sky where there aren't any stars by looking past the earliest stars and thus farther back in time. But even when we point our telescopes past the earliest stars, we still see light. Not starlight, but the light left over from the Big Bang. We detect this cosmic background radiation coming more or less evenly from all directions, forming a background beyond the stars. So I guess the night sky isn't actually dark to begin with. Right, so if our telescopes tell us that the night sky isn't dark, then why does it look dark? Here's a clue to the real answer. When the Hubble telescope photographed the distant stars of the astoundingly beautiful Hubble Extreme Deep Field, it took the picture using an infrared camera. Why? Well, distant stars and galaxies are moving away from us because the universe is expanding. So the same way a record slowing down lowers the pitch of my voice, the Doppler effect causes stars moving away from us to become redder. And the farther away they are, the faster they move away from us and the redder they become, until they become infrared. And then we can't see them anymore at least not with our human eyes. And that's why the night sky appears dark. In summary, if we lived in an infinite, unchanging universe, the entire sky would be as bright as the sun. But the sky is dark at night, both because the universe had a beginning so there aren't stars in every direction, and more importantly, because the light from super distant stars and the even more distant cosmic background radiation gets redshifted away from the visible spectrum by the expansion of the universe. So we just plain can't see it. Finally, We've shed some light on why the night sky is dark, and why it isn't. So, it, so I know that sounds confusing, but let, let me just summarize. So the sky is not dark, A, because when we look back in time, we're looking before stars. B, we're looking back to uh, the creation of the universe itself 
uh, and see those things that are very, very far away are actually red shifted out of the visible spectrum. Okay. So the, the video mentioned the cosmic microwave background. We'll be covering that uh, on Thursday. So here is the way to look at um, looking through, uh, looking at the universe. So as we look to the universe, the, uh, the age that we're looking back to increases. So we can go, we can uh, take a photograph of nearby galaxies. So <clears throat> we are 13.8 billion years since the beginning of the universe. As we look farther and farther away, we're looking at an earlier and earlier universe. So here, for example, the Hubble deep field photograph, which I think I showed you last time, is taken of galaxies that were around a billion years from the creation of the universe. Then there was an ultra deep field photograph, uh, which is even more impressive, which is 400 million years since the uh, creation of the universe. And then as we look back and back, we finally get to the creation of the Big Bang, the universe itself. And so this is what's a little mind blowing. If I can look far enough back, I see the creation of the universe and it's not in a place in the universe, it's a sphere surrounding us. It is all the universe because that sphere surrounding us is what I see when I look back 13.8 billion years ago, okay? So it, it's, you can consider it the edge of the universe, but it's kind of like when you're walking through a fog, okay? You, you're walking through a fog and you think that there's the edge of the fog because you can see to a certain point until you can't see through the fog. And so there is an edge to your observable universe, so to speak, which is the edge of the fog. But as you walk through that fog, that edge changes, okay? It's centered on you because you can only see, you know, three feet in the fog, but it, it will change. So again, any other galaxy would also see the Big Bang as the sphere surrounding them. So it's not like it's an actual sphere. It's like that bubble that surrounds you when you're walking in the fog. We can actually see the beginning of the universe. Alex, that is exactly right. Uh, the beginning of the universe, uh, what we see is, is known as the cosmic microwave background or CMB. And we'll be covering that extensively on Thursday. So uh, when we look at the Hubble ultra deep field photograph, which I think I showed you, I think I showed you both of these, we're looking 13 billion years from us from today, but you know, 700 million years from the beginning of the Big Bang. So time from us goes this way, time from the beginning of the universe goes that way. Okay. So a uh, couple, we've got a bunch of smaller subjects. We'll buzz through these and then we'll open it up for questions. There's two principles when we talk about the universe, there's two principles that we use. These, these are not like scientific laws. They're just philosophical principles that help us figure things out. And as far as we know, these are, these are always true. But again, these are philosophical, not scientific. The cosmological principle says, well, first of all, the universe is not infinite and unchanging, but it is homogeneous and isotropic. Okay, so the, remember the Obler's paradox was four things. Two of them we, we proved cannot be true, infinite and unchanging, but the other true, the cosmological principle states that they are true on large scales that when we look at the largest scales, every part of the universe looks like every other part of the universe and every part that we look, looks like every other angle that we look, okay? So the universe is homogeneous, it's the same everywhere, isotropic, it's the same every direction on large scales, okay? So there's no special part of the universe, it's all the same, we're all one big happy family, okay? Kumbaya. Now, on smaller scales, the universe has a lot of uh, structure, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. The Copernican principle is related. Uh, the Copernican principle is named uh, after Copernicus because Copernicus was the first person in the modern era to say that we are not the center of the universe. Copernicus, remember, said that the 
earth is not the center of the universe the sun is okay and so what he said was we do not occupy a special place in the universe we're just one planet and as we've explored the universe we've discovered uh our sun you know uh, first of all we personally are not special because we're just happen to be on the surface of the earth and there's lots of other people on the surface of the earth so the earth does not revolve around us personally although it seems like that because i walk around and you know all i see is what's around me uh called the illusion of central position in psychology well but then we thought, okay, well, maybe I'm not the center of the universe, but the earth is the center of the universe. Well, then Copernicus says, no, 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 no. The sun is the center of the universe. Well, then as we discover more and more, we discover, uh, wait a second, the sun is not the center of the universe. You know, there's lots of other stars out there. In fact, we're not even in a special part in our galaxy. Maybe our galaxy is special. The Copernican principle says nobody is special. Okay. We do not occupy a special place or time in the universe. Okay. We do not occupy a special place in the universe. So it's related to the cosmological principle. The cosmological principle says the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. The Copernican principle says we do not occupy a special place in that homogeneous and isotropic universe. Again, these are philosophical statements. Um, but as far as we know, they've never been violated. Every place we look, we find how less and less special we are. Okay. We thought our solar system was special. Well, it turns out virtually all stars have solar systems. Uh, we thought that the rocky planets we, we have are special. And it turns out they're not. Okay. So why are the Copernican principle and the cosmological principle helpful for doing astronomy? They're helpful because they say, if we can observe our part of the universe, then the rest of the universe is just like that. Okay. And that's why those, those principles are so useful. If instead we said, well, we can observe our part of the universe, but other parts of the universe are completely different, we can't really do science with the universe. Uh, and then then we, we would live in a magical place where anything could happen at any place at any time. That's not the universe we occupy. Every place we look, the universe follows the same laws, the same rules. Everything is the same everywhere we look. There's no special part of the universe. There's no special laws we all observe the same rules of the same game. Large scale structure of the universe. So here's the universe on, on much larger scales. And remember the, the, the cosmological principle is that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. They mean really large scales. When we look at it, uh, in medium scales, what you see is this filamentary structure. The universe is not randomly populated with galaxies. The, each dot is a galaxy. And there's anywhere from 100 billion to a trillion galaxies in the observable universe. And remember, we don't know how large the universe is. All we know is how large the observable universe is. Within the observable universe, galaxies are not oriented randomly they instead follow this spider webby structure, okay? And this spider webby structure tells us something profound about how the universe developed. And we'll be getting into those, into what it tells us about the universe in the next couple of lectures. And this video will show you what the universe looks like. Again, these are the positions of galaxies. And this only lists half a million galaxies, but remember the universe itself contains uh, hundreds of billions of galaxies. So this is a small sampling of all the galaxies in the universe. So Morgan says, there's no true center of the universe ever, even 13 billion years ago. That's absolutely true. The universe has no center because there was no space time to have a center in. When the universe uh, was created, it created the mass, the energy, and space-time itself all in the same place. Uh, okay, so now you can see this filamentary structure here. You might notice these little cutouts, okay? Those cutouts are not real. Those cutouts are because the Milky Way galaxy blocks our view of the universe from those directions, okay? So that's why it's got this. 
But in the areas where the Milky Way galaxy doesn't um, block it, you can see this filamentary structure, okay? And that's really profound. But now that space-time exists, can the universe now have a center? No. Uh, so the universe has a center in the same way that walking through a fog has a center. It looks like the universe has a center, but every place I walk, uh, I get a different, uh, I get a different center in a different circle. And so, for example, if there's a universe, uh, a galaxy that's a hundred million light years from us, it will see a circle that surrounds us that its observable universe, and it's different than our observable universe. Okay. So the answer is yes and no. Um, the universe has a center. It's always centered on us, but obviously that center changes as we move to a different place. So because the universe is homogeneous, we can use partial images to assume that the, what the entire universe looks like. Um, so hope, what I'm showing you in this video is just what we can observe given the fact that we're embedded in the Milky Way galaxy and our view of the universe is blocked in certain directions. But certainly the, the cosmological principle says that if we were able to fill out these wedges, it would look approximately the same. And I think every cosmologist on the planet believes that, that there's no hidden, uh, you know, flying spaghetti monster shapes in these hidden areas that we can't observe through the Milky Way galaxy. That if we ever develop satellites that could pop above and below the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, we'd, we would see approximately the same things here. Uh, so yes, you're right. The cosmological principle is an assumption, but boy, it's been proved right a billion times in the last 200 years. Uh, and again, we are embedded in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, three coordinate systems, as we talked about previously, the coordinate system of the solar system, uh, the coordinate system of our planet, and the coordinate system of the Milky Way galaxy itself, and those are three different coordinate systems. Uh, here, as I showed before, if we see uh, the red dots refer to X-ray binaries, and those red dots mean that, uh, and this map is in uh, galactic coordinate systems and Milky Way galaxy coordinate systems. Uh, so it's mapped to the origin of the Milky Way galaxy. So the center right there is the center of the galaxy from our perspective. These red dots are all oriented along this line, which is oriented on the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. So what that says is X-ray binaries uh, belong in the Milky Way galaxy. Whereas if we, if we look at say Seifert galaxies, you look, they cover every place. And then what that says is uh, they must not be associated with the Milky Way galaxy uh, because they're not clustered on that, uh, on that plane. Okay. So here is, uh, these are, this map is a map of gamma ray burst. C is a map of uh, X-ray bursts. And so what this tells us is gamma ray bursts are not in our galaxy, they're in other galaxies. Uh, so let's do some uh, quick questions. The darkness of the sky in an infinite universe is, A, is explained by general relativity, B, results from the presence of dark matter, C, is a statement of Olber's paradox. D, is the cosmological principle. E, occurs if the universe is static and unchanging. And the answer is C. It's a statement of Olber's paradox. The redshift of galaxies is explained best as A, Doppler shift of the random motions of galaxies. B, an aging of light as the universe ages. C, space itself expanding with time stretching light. D, the result of Milky Way's position at the center. D, E, is due to the temperature differences in the early and late universe. And the answer is C. Hubble's law implies that the universe 
A is infinitely old and getting larger. B began expanding long ago and has a finite age. C will slow down because of dark matter. D has repeatedly expanded, contracted. E will eventually stop and recollapse. Oh. So the correct answer here, or at least the answer the textbook wants, is B. That's what it was looking for. The problem is you could, uh, I, I would never use this question on the exam because you could make the case for C and D. C because dark matter actually does slow down the universe. It's, it's matter after all. Uh, D because maybe the universe is repeatedly expanding, contracting. We just don't know. Okay. We just don't know. Uh, so, because distant galaxies in every direction are moving away from us, A, the Milky Way must be located at the edge of the universe, B, the Milky Way is at the center of the universe, C, the universe is expanding, D, the, the sky is dark at night, E, the universe has not changed significantly. And the correct answer is C, the universe is expanding. Okay, uh, let's skip dark energy preview. Let's stop the lecture and I'm open for questions. You can turn on your mic or just put things in chat. I know this has been uh, kind of mind expanding. Uh, now that uh, I saw that they found acid, uh, evidence of amino acids on Venus. Yes, they did. Um, so Joseph, one of the things that it's so weird when you're in science is that there's thousands of, well, not thousands, but there's lots of things every day that uh, are discoveries. And the things that show up in the popular press, uh, sometimes it feels random. So what they discovered in, in Venus was a, a single spectral line that is for a single uh, amino acid that um, they don't know of any non-biological way to create that amino acid. Now, the fact that they discovered an amino acid is, is nothing spectacular. We've discovered amino acids throughout the entire galaxy. They're, they're not created with life. There's, there's other ways other than life to create these amino acids. Um, but th there's two problems with the discovery of amino acids in the, in the atmosphere of Venus. Problem number one was it was done with a single spectral line which is a bit fishy, that, that bothers me a little bit. The, the second thing is we don't know how ways other than biology to create that amino acid. Doesn't mean there's no way. It just means we don't know a way. And the thing is, as we explore the universe, the reason why uh, astronomy is so amazing is that we're discovering things in environments that are totally alien from the earth. And we're discovering things that, that you know, the sorts of chemical reactions that would be impossible on the earth, but that happen routinely in outer space. So for example, we think that the, uh, the deep atmosphere of Saturn rains diamonds, for example, but the pressure is so great that those diamonds eventually evaporate before they hit the, uh, the core. Um, so, you know, it's interesting, but it, it's not, you know, that the popular press was saying, we discovered life on Venus. No, 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 no. <laughs> we discovered interesting evidence that there might be something weird going on. This happened a couple of times before, uh, in, during the uh, Viking landers in the 1970s on Mars, they said they found evidence for life. Well, it turns out it was just very peculiar chemistry during with dealing with perchlorites, which is a whole nother matter. Uh, and in 1989, uh, we discovered a, a meteorite on Earth, on Earth that people thought were fossils of bacteria. And we knew for a fact that this meteorite came from Mars. Well, it turns out that there are non-biological ways to create those things that look like fossils. So that we have a saying in astronomy, it's never aliens. <laughs> because so many times, hundreds of times in the past, we made a discovery that we thought was aliens and, and it wasn't. Tabby Star, most recently, 
uh, the interstellar comet, uh, most, most recently, um, Martian canals, for example. Um, so because the universe is homogeneous, we can use partially, oh, I already answered that. Uh, the news will always exaggerate stuff like that for clicks. Yeah, our, you know, it's interesting that when I was a kid, uh, I thought, and, and most people thought that if you gave everybody on the planet access to all the information that we would reach some sort of nirvana, that information would solve all problems. And in fact, we have discovered to our horror that free access to information means that vetting of information now becomes much more important than we thought. I mean, we're flooded. It used to be that we, if we wanted to learn about something, we went to the encyclopedia or we went to the library and that information is deeply vetted. Nowadays, we go to the internet, the information is just not vetted at all. And so the truth is, is awash in a sea of horrible stuff. And where that horrible stuff that's not true emulates from the highest offices in the land, that makes it even worse. Uh, any science fiction books that you can recommend? Uh, my favorite, uh, so I'm, I'm of the Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov uh, trend. Um, so if you want just uh, what we call space opera, I'd recommend, of course, the Foundation Trilogy, which will be on Apple Plus next year. Uh, in terms of modern science fiction books, by far the best modern science fiction, the most mind-blowing. It took me a couple of days to recover when I read the trilogy. It's called The Three-Body Problem. It's from China. Uh, it's a very, very unusual, and it will, if you read all three books in the series, one of which is called The Dark Forest, it will literally blow your mind. I saw an article saying there was snow on a comet recently seen. Is that an exaggeration or actually possible? Um, yeah, I'm, Hannah, I'm not really sure what that's talking about. I do know that comets, as they heat up, will, uh, will explode stuff from the surface. Uh, so we saw this with the, uh, with the um, uh, asteroid that was recently landed on, uh, was it last week? Uh, and what they would see is that the sun would heat up the surface of the, uh, uh, of the asteroid and little pops of it would, would just spray off from the surface. Uh, and, and so certainly we, uh, we see comets all the time that will spray stuff off from the surface going outwards. And that would be snow, although it's going the wrong direction. What is the likelihood that there's other intelligent life in the universe? So Blake, that's a subject of great debate. I actually uh, teach an entire course of that at Duke. Um, I, and everybody has their personal opinion. Uh, the, the way we codify that is... I feel like Cal Cunningham, he's just going to be up in all this fucking everyone's lives. I'm sorry? I'm going to mute everybody. Sorry. I don't know anything about either of them. Um, so uh, the, the way to codify the chances of intelligent life in the universe is what's known as the Drake equation. Uh, and... Uh, I personally think that, and, and really, I don't like to talk about the universe because the universe is too big. I'd like to talk about the Milky Way galaxy. You know, what are the chances that there are intelligent life in the Milky Way galaxy? I think the, the answer is no for a bunch of reasons. And that's why I, I spent an entire lecture on this uh, through primarily through the Fermi paradox. Uh, and then also through um, the, uh, uh, what we call the rare earth hypothesis. So the Fermi paradox says that um, if the universe is filled with intelligent life, our, our Milky Way galaxy is filled with intelligent life, over 10 billion years the Milky Way has existed, certainly at least one of those civilizations should have developed the capability of doing interstellar travel and they would have colonized the entire galaxy. To colonize the entire galaxy, if you have interstellar travel capability, it would take just a few million years. And remember, we're talking 10 billion years. And so the fact that that has obviously not happened because we don't hear them, we don't see them, is the, is the guts of the Fermi paradox. That if intelligent life is common, the entire Milky Way galaxy should have been colonized by now, and it's not. The rare earth hypothesis said that uh, we are very, very, very special which counterdicts the uh, Copernican principle in spades. But the reason why it can counterdict the Copernican principle is what's known as the 
uh, weak anthropic principle, the fact that we could be very, very special and we don't know it because if we weren't very, very special, we wouldn't be here to have this discussion. So for example, the Earth's climate has been constant for four and a half billion years. That certainly not happened to any other planet in our in our solar system. I mean, look at Venus and look at Mars, both of whom have gone to the extremes. The Earth has never gone to extreme, too hot or too cold. Why is that? It could just be random chance. And if that random chance is one in a billion or one in a hundred billion, well, uh, we're here. And if we hadn't been that one in a hundred billion chance, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We'd be one of the others. So that's the rare earth hypothesis. And yeah, I could go on and on. Uh, would you ever help develop a scientifically accurate video game? I would love to do that. That was one of my dreams. Um, by the way, I was respond. I wrote the world's first interactive flight simulator in 1973. Um, and uh, we had a big celebration of that at the uh, computer museum in, uh, in um, Silicon Valley about three years ago. Uh, so, yeah, and so, uh, so Ward, yeah, the, the three body problem, that's, it's by far the most popular science, uh, science fiction book ever written by a Chinese author. It is mind blowing. Uh, China just spent a billion dollars on a uh, large radio telescope. And part of the reason they did that was because of the three body problem in that book, because they wanted to devote some of the time on that radio telescope to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, and one of the major themes of the trilogy is called the dark forest, which, well, just look it up. Uh, I always thought the universe was way too young for the Fermi paradox to, to apply. The universe is old, sure, but most of the history was pretty inhospitable. Massive, short-lived, violently exploding stars aren't great for the development of intelligent life. So Sam, yeah, that's true, except that uh, the, we believe that the Milky Way galaxy has been habitable different regions of the Milky Way galaxy, especially the outer reaches for 10 billion years. So about three or 4 billion years after the formation of the, uh, of the universe. And, and so lots of people have studied that and that's, that was their consensus. Uh, so there's habitable zones of planets around suns, but there's also habitable zones in, uh, in galaxies. And the habitable zone in our galaxy has, has increased in the early days. It was pretty far out in the boonies, but it's, it's grown in since then. Uh, where can we download the flight simulator? So Sam, unfortunately you can't. Uh, the reason why is I wrote it for a computer system called Plato uh, that was one of the earliest computer systems, uh, interactive graphics computer systems ever. It started in the 1960s and went on until the mid 1990s. It's, it's now obsolete. Um, uh, I, can, I have an emulator on my, on my um, computer and so I can run a, a simulation of it. But in fact, my writing that flight simulator predates my getting my flight uh, um, flying license. So it was kind of, you, people usually go the other way around. Uh, the movie is called The Wandering Earth. Yeah. So Ward, I saw the movie The Wandering Earth. It's by the same author, but it's a very different, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not that movie. Um, and I, I didn't really like The Wandering Earth. Um, so art, yes, that's right. It's a flight simulator simulator. Very good. Um, I, Ward, I do know that uh, the three-body problem is, a movie is in development. Uh, I don't know if it's purely Chinese or if there are any Americans involved in, the, in that production. Do you know by any chance? Yeah, I guess maybe there will be some like foreigners participating in the filming process. But um, anyway, I believe they will have some translations, something like that, you know, the captions. Yeah, I hope so. Because I mean, it just that I've never, not since I was a kid, have I had uh, a book that so blew my mind, um, especially, uh, as they, yeah. especially as they got into the dark forest. So. Right. Uh, and and that book has really caused a lot of discussion. And I think that book has influenced a lot of uh, people like Neil deGrasse and, and, uh, and Stephen Hawking uh, to think about, do we want to attract extraterrestrials? Um, and they say, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, and there, yeah, and there's some, some kind of like a specific forum about it in, in China, you know, through online platforms. 
Yeah. The, the translator, uh, uh, of that book for the Americans is, is become a, a real celebrity in his own right. And he's written a series of books too. I've, I've downloaded, I haven't, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's quite something. Uh, anyway, I'm out of time. Uh, this has been fun. Uh, like I said, this part of the course is really mind expanding and I'll see you all on Thursday. And, uh, if you haven't voted, you need to vote right now. Thanks a lot. See you later. Happy Tuesday, Brian. And, Happy Election Day to all of you. Stop sharing.